Now, this is not always necessary, but uh, exchange might impose limits on how much the contract price can change from the previous day's settlement price. Now, take an example. Let's say that the contract price is equal to dollars ten, and let's say that the exchange imposes a limit of dollars four. So, essentially, then the exchange is saying that the maximum. that the price can become on a given day is dollars 14 and the minimum that the price can become on a given day is dollars 6 so if the price moves to either dollars 14 and stays there or comes down to dollars 6 then we say that is a limit move if the price goes up to 14 and is stuck there then we call that a limit up if the price comes down to dollar 6 and stays there then that's called a limit down and effectively let's just take a scenario first before we come to the limit locked situation let's say that on a given day there is immense uh, interest in the underlying and the price goes up to 14 and let's say that people are willing to traders are willing to also buy and sell for dollar 15 on that day but once the price hits 14 then all trading in that uh, in that contract will cease and uh, at least on officially on the exchange the trading will cease and the price will be stuck at 14 the next day if the interest is still very high then there will still be no trading if if buyers and sellers want to trade at 15 uh, there will still be no trading and we will be stuck at 14 however if the interest subsides and the price comes back down to under 14 and people are willing to buy or sell for say 13.95 then transactions can happen but if for a number of days we are either locked here at 14 or we are locked at 6 then we can say that we are limit locked and here the exchange can intervene so the exchange can then essentially assign a new price or open up the limit and let's say we go with a scenario where there is tremendous amount of interest the exchange can uh, open up trading and allow trading to then happen at dollars 15 so key point is that the exchange has flexibility to uh, to open up the limit if it so wants Now let's talk about the methods to terminate a futures position. There is a fair amount of detail in the curriculum on this, but I think as long as you just understand the core points that should be good enough. So one method of terminating a futures contract is to simply take a reverse position or a offsetting position. So for example, if you are in a contract to buy a certain underlying and let's say that the contract expiry date is 31st july what you could do say you've taken a let's say you took a long position for this expiry date now a few days before let's say a couple of days before you can take a offsetting position so you can essentially then get into a short position so you take a opposite position and depending on the price of the contract if the price of the contract has uh, gone up then obviously the long benefits if the price goes has gone down then the long has lost out but the core point is that a reversal simply means that if you had a long position then you take a opposite position and and for obvious reasons that's basically called a offsetting trade the other is a cash settlement so essentially what happens with the cash settlement is you figure out who, how much you owe the exchange or how much the exchange owes you and that amount is settled in cash another way is the delivery of asset so if we have a, a delivery of an asset there the short is responsible for delivering the asset to the long and obviously the long needs to pay the contractually agreed upon price typically with delivery of asset or at times with the delivery of asset the short has an option 
has some delivery options so if the short has options about which specific uh, item to deliver where to deliver or flexibility in terms of when to deliver then those options are valuable to the short we'll see this in the context of treasury bonds later another way of terminating a futures position is through the exchange for physicals in a exchange for physicals the actually what can happen is say you are long and you identify another party that is short on the same contract you can meet with the short party outside the exchange and simply settle with this short and then inform both parties then need to inform the exchange that this settlement has taken place and obviously then the position for both the long and short is terminated over the next few slides we'll talk about some specific futures contracts that the CFA institute wants you to know and these contracts are treasury bill contracts euro dollar treasury bond stock index and currency contracts so let us start with the t bill futures contract and this is the us t bill that we are talking about the first comment here is that it's based on a notional principle 1 million and and the underlying is a 90 day t bill so this notional principle really means that one contract means that in that one contract we have t bills with a par value of 1 million and what exactly now does this mean so what does it mean to say that you are long let's say you are long one contract of this uh, of this futures contract so what does that mean what that means is let's say that this is time zero this is where you take your long position and let's say that this contract expires on day 30 so when you go long effectively that means that you are getting into a contract to buy the 100 million dollars worth of t-bills or 100 million par value worth of 90 day t-bills on this date on maturity so on day zero you are getting into a contract to buy t-bills on this day and more specifically you are getting into a contract to buy 90 day t bills on this day now how are these quoted so on day zero let's say that the contract is quoted at 93.75 93.75 and i'm using an example from the curriculum so you can follow this um, easily in the curriculum also so let's say that this is the quote and just as an aside this convention of using 100 minus the annualized 90 day t bill this convention is called the imm convention so you open up your newspaper or you check online and you see that the futures contract that is expiring in 30 days is currently quoted at 93.75 so what exactly does this mean what what are you going to get on day 30 let's look at this formula here now the quote 93.75 is 100 minus the annualized 90 day t bill rate so if 93.75 is 100 minus this annualized 90 day t bill rate then the annualized 90 day t bill rate must be 6.25 percent because 100 minus 6.25 percent will give you 93.75 so what this means is on day zero if you get into this futures contract on on this day zero then per this contract on day 30 you will get 1 million dollar par value worth of 90 day t bills which are yielding 6.25 percent now again recall from earlier lectures that on t bills when we give this quoted percentage this is based on a discount so it is based on a discount to par value so how do you figure out how many dollars worth of t bills are you getting and the answer again is 
straightforward. You you have seen this before, but just to do our calculation, the power value is one million. The annualized discount is six point two five. So what is the discount for a ninety day period? The discount for a ninety day period is equal to zero point zero six two five. That's simply converting the percent into decimal. And changing this for uh, so that's annualized. Changing this into a 90-day period will give you 0.0625 into 90 over 360. So that is the discount. Now this is the discount that is applied to a one million dollar par value. So the amount that the T bills will be worth over here will be equal to 1 minus this multiplied by 1 million. So remember that this number that you calculate over here is your discount to par. So to come up with the value of the T bills that you will get at, at expiry of the futures contract you do 1 minus the 90 day version of a 6.25 percent discount yield and uh, multiply that by 1 million and this should give you 983.750. So what this is saying is when you get into a futures contract on day 0 where the quoted price is 93.75 then on day 30 where the contract expires you will get T bills worth 983750 and obviously given a given a bank discount yield of 6.25% this means that 90 days later so 90 days later this bond will uh, if if you get th get this bond over here for 93750 that's how much you will actually have to pay in dollar terms 90 days later this will become 1 million and 1 million discounted back to 983750 is essentially the 6.25% yield. So what is one tick or one minimum price change in the context of a T-bill futures contract and the answer is it is 0 0.0001 which is 0.01% one basis point and one basis point represents $25 per a million dollar contract. Just to highlight this point, let's say you go long when the price is quoted at 93.75. So if you take a long position and the next day let's say the price goes to 9376 that means that $25 will be added to your account per contract. If obviously the price goes up the following day by two basis points, then the amount added to your account is 25 times two, which is $1.50. So hopefully you can now understand why this sort of a convention is used. Uh, as you are familiar with by now, what you want to see is for a long position you benefit when the price of the underlying goes up so the price of the underlying is quoted in this convention as you see this price go up the long is happy if this price goes down then the long will be unhappy had we simply quoted this based on an interest rate then that would have created a convoluted issue where interest rate going up is bad for a bondholder so an interest rate going down would be good for a bondholder so then we would have a opposite situation which would become rather confusing hence this convention where we use 100 minus the annualized rate so notice that if the rate goes down that's good for the bondholder so rate going down means that this IMM metric goes up so rate goes down the the quoted amount goes up and the holder of the long position is happy now let's talk about the euro dollar futures 
and since the market was so used to the quoting convention for T-bill futures when uh, when the euro dollar futures were introduced the market simply uses practically the same convention for euro dollars even though in general T-bills are quoted on a discount basis and in general euro dollar time deposits or CDs are quoted on a add on basis but nevertheless when we talk about euro dollar futures they are quoted exactly the same way as T-bills so notice even the notional principle is the same so based on a notional principle of 1 million based on a 90 day LIBOR and quoted using the IMM convention where we use 100 minus annualized 90 day LIBOR like T-bills these are also settled like T-bill futures these are also settled in cash and like before one tick represents one basis point or 0.01 percent and a increase of one tick represents a dollar 25 benefit to the long on a 1 million dollar contract so all the calculations for euro dollar futures are the same as the calculations that i just showed you on the previous uh, slide now we'll talk about treasury bond futures so these treasury bonds essentially are traded for hundred thousand dollar par bonds so that's our notional principle but the constraint is that the bonds must have a maturity of greater than 15 years now when you get into a contract say as the long party the short party has an op option to deliver any of several bonds so the reason we have this thing in place is to avoid a run on a particular bond so if if this contract were based on a specific bond then as the futures contract expires the short party would rush to buy that bond and that might convolute the price hence the way these uh, these futures contracts are structured the short is allowed to deliver any of uh, a whole range of bonds and effectively what happens is the exchange defines a conversion factor so more valuable bonds receive higher payments so obviously different bonds will have different coupon rates and that's just one example the different bonds might be you know have slightly different liquidity and so on so different bonds will have slightly different values and to bring all the bonds to a similar base the exchange specifies a conversion factor for every bond but the calculation for this conversion factor is somewhat simplistic so even when we apply the conversion factor there will be some bonds that are cheaper for the short relative to other bonds and the bond that is cheapest for the short to deliver is called the cheapest to deliver now how we come up with the conversion factor and so on this is complicated this is covered in level 2 all you really need to know at this stage is that dealing with treasury bond futures has this complication where the short has several different bonds from which to choose the second point is that the exchange for every bond will have a conversion factor where there is a formula for calculating the conversion factor but you don't need to know that formula and despite that formula there will be a bond which is the cheapest or the best bond for the short to deliver and that bond is called the cheapest to deliver clearly i'm skipping several details but uh, fortunately for you those details are not necessary at this stage treasury bond futures are again quoted in percentage terms and they are actually quoted either in in points so you might have a bond quoted at 90 uh, uh, a treasury bond future quoted at 98.6525 or in fractions of 32 so this same thing could also be quoted as 98 and 18 over 32 so for a contract covering a thousand dollar par bond effectively this means that the price is this so 
here the tick is 1 over 32 which for a $100,000 power bond is 31.25 and again as always the long benefits when the price goes up so if the price goes up by uh, so if the price is currently quoted at uh, 98 and 18 over 32 one tick up would mean that the price is quoted at 98 and 19 over 32 this means that on a per contract basis the long has benefited by 31.25 dollars and obviously if the price goes down then that is a loss for the long and a benefit for the short Stock index futures, these are fairly popular and we have index futures on the FTSE, the Nikkei, the CAC in France, DAX, Germany and the S&P 500 in the US. Perhaps the world's most popular stock index futures are on the S&P 500. Index futures are settled in cash because of the obvious reason that it would not be so easy to simply deliver all the uh, say all the 225 shares underlying this or the 500 shares underlying the S&P so futures contracts are settled in cash and also with futures contracts we typically have a multiplier in the case of the S&P 500 we have a multiplier of $250 now how does this work let's say that we have the S&P 500 index future which is currently quoted at 1240. Now this represents the price of the index and let's again be clear about what this means. Let's say that we are talking about the December futures contract for the S&P 500. Let's say time zero we are here October 25th and this futures contract expires in December so later this year so what does this mean and the exchange will specify exactly what day in December this contract expires effectively what we are saying is that when you go long one one contract that contract will have a multiplier of 250 so let's first take a one contract situation so you go long one contract when the price is one two four zero let's say next day which is day one the price goes up by one dollar if the price goes up by one dollar then the benefit to the long is one dollar multiplied by 250 which is equal to 250 so if the price goes up by one the long benefits by one times the multiplier which is 250 if the price goes up by two then the long benefits by 500 and the short loses by 500 and so on now what if you went long 10 contracts so again the maths is very straightforward so if you go long 10 contracts and the price goes up by one then on a per contract basis you made 250 on 10 contracts you made 250 into 10 which is equal to 2500 finally currency futures we spoke about currency forwards in the previous lecture and actually the currency forwards market is much larger than the currency futures market but nevertheless currency futures are actively traded in the US so you need to know how they work we have in the US currency contracts for the euro for Mexican peso Japanese yen Canadian dollars and so on generally all major currencies so how does this work currency contracts are set in units of the foreign currency and the price is stated in dollars per unit so a very popular contract is the euro contract where the underlying is 125,000 euros and this is quoted as shown here in dollars per euro again taking an example from the curriculum let's say that this contract is currently quoted at 0 0.8555 per euro and again to highlight the point you are here on day zero 
so when you get into the contract the contract price is 0.8555 per euro this means that when the contract settles let's say 30 days from today so at time zero you are getting into a contract to buy say you are taking the long position so you are getting into a contract to buy 125,000 euros at 0.8555 per euro on this day now on day one for example let's say so actually before i go to day one what exactly does this mean so this is the price per euro then the contract price essentially is 125 euros into 0.8555 dollars per year which is equal to 106937 so on day zero you are getting into a contract to buy 125,000 euros for 106937.50 dollars now if on day one the euro appreciates so the euro on day one let's say that this same forward contract on day one is now worth zero is now quoted at 0 0.8556 so this went up by one tick the euro appreciated remember the euro is the underlying here so the underlying went up which means that the long benefited by how much he benefited by 125,000 multiplied by 0 0.0001 one so you can do the maths so if if the underlying had gone up by two ticks then we would simply simply multiply 125,000 by 0 0.0002 and so on so the common theme across the board here with futures is that when the underlying or the quoted amount goes up the long benefits and when the quoted amount goes down then the short benefits so that is it you need to practice hard as always there are nine questions in the curriculum on this which you should do very carefully o only uh, most of these questions are not multiple choice but nevertheless when you practice these questions your concepts will uh, will get clear so that is it post any comments that you have on youtube and if you like this video then click on the like button